I'd rather suffer here than in the UK. I mean, it's cold. Let's, let's suffer in the heat. Do you know what I mean? The UK isn't my home because I went through so much there. Um, things like being 12 years old, walking down the street with my little brother and having men 18, 19, 20 years old shouting racial abuse at us in the street. I've been called the M-word before. I've been called a monkey. Really? Yeah. For me as a mum, there's only one way to deal with that. I'm either going to fight or I'm going to, you know. I also experienced racism. I remember, you know, being called the N-word, walking across the road and not really understanding why. Yeah, I went to university twice and I dropped out twice, to be honest with you. Yeah, literally right. twice. If I could go back in time, I would go back to uni drop twice again. and drop out twice <laughs> again. At five years old, he came back and he told me, um, I don't play with anyone, mummy, I don't have friends. And I said, oh, why, what, what happened, Kaziah? And he said, the little boys at school said they don't want to be my friend because I'm not white. So me and Jenny, we actually met online, to be honest. Really? Yeah, we did, yeah, we did, we did. Online dating. Online what? dating, so. That, that, Tinder that, to be exact. Tinder to be exact, <laughs> yeah. Um, I could be the best mother to my children, they, and my children, they have the freedom to run around, you know. In the UK, our house was so small, so playing football in the house and all those things, it, you can imagine how that goes. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode and this is the Diaspora Transition episode. We interview people who decided to leave the diaspora to relocate to the continent and uh, you know as you guys already know the last week episode I interviewed Daniel and uh, Jerome. They are a couple who decided to leave the UK to Ghana and they're literally living in the middle of nowhere. Now we said in an interview that uh, Daniel said my daughter's coming. Two of my daughters are coming. Mm. My oldest daughter and one of my 13 year olds are coming and my two grandchildren. Mm. Um, so, uh, as I'm just saying it now, brother, it, I didn't convince them. Mm. I didn't say anything to convince them. They just saw. So they saw what I was doing out here and my actions have been my testimony. That's what's, you know, sparked my daughter and said, ah, look what my dad's done and he's made a better life for himself. And she's seen that and she's recognized that she wants that same life for herself and her family. They are here with us here on the show today and uh, I really want to interview them, you know, how their journey started, why they decided to join their, you know, father or her father in Ghana and uh, I'm so excited. So without further ado, Kay and Jada, welcome on the show. Thank you very now, much. Now, Akwaba, that's how we say it when you get to Ghana, meaning welcome. Medassi. Now, I was, I was at the airport when you guys arrived. Can you tell me like the, the moment? You know, you touched down in Ghana, how did it feel like? Oh, what's good, bro? What's good? Oh, are you good? Yeah. Oh my God. I'm coming, man. I'm telling you, you're here, you're here. I'll start. Um, to be honest, it was, it was an overwhelming feeling. Like for me personally, I've been wanting to come back home for so long that um, I'd envisioned this moment. I felt, I, I even remembered the heat. Like when I was younger, landing in Nigeria, I was anticipating that again. Just walking out of the airport, feeling the, the air of Africa again, and it was amazing. It was amazing, yeah. How was your experience like? Have you ever been to Africa? Or was never been. I've never been to um, anywhere in Ghana, actually, in Africa, actually. Um, for me, it was very overwhelming, but it also felt like a sigh of relief. I just felt like, like I could just breathe when I touched down, when I came out of the airport. I took in everything. I was trying to, you know, smell the air, feel the heat. Um, and oh, I just can't even describe the feeling. Just pure excitement, pure excitement. Well, let's take you back. You know, Dan is your, is your father. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he moved to the continent almost three years ago, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Now, let's, let's go back a little bit. When he was moving, where were you at that time? So we was in West Drayton in London. Um, it's called Hillenden, it's a small little area. And I remember when my dad moved, I remember feeling like, you know, what's he doing? It's crazy because like I said, we don't know anyone in Ghana, yeah. you know? Um, a lot of our family's in Jamaica. So it's something I wanted to do, but I was like, how is he gonna do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and us being from the small little place in Hillenden, it was like, how are we gonna do this? You know, this is when the, the questions started going in my head. This is something I wanna do, but how am I gonna do this? Yeah. How am I gonna get there? Um, and so watching his journey definitely, it's definitely had its ups and downs because he wasn't sure in the beginning, but 
seeing him now, it just inspiring, yeah. inspiring. So you, you were watching? Before. Watching, watching. <laughs> watching, we didn't stop watching. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't stop watching. Man. Wow, where were you at that time too? You were so I was, yeah, I was with Jada as well, yeah. So um, just before they left from our place. Mm -hmm. So um, we was with them for that whole, pretty much that whole week before they left. So, you know, it was, it was surreal because even from me, from my perspective, obviously, I'm Nigerian, I have family in Nigeria as well. And I just know that sometimes, you know, there's a rhetoric that goes around about Africa being so difficult. And, you know, like, mm -hmm. if you aren't rich and you have loads of connections, it's going to be really hard for you to settle down. Um, so for me to witness uh, Mr. King going and making that move, it, it filled me with confidence, to be honest. And I had a lot of respect because I know that it's not something, it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of people that doubt it. There's a lot of people that could question what you're doing. But to have that self-belief and to have the drive to just go and do it, that's not, it definitely works something up in me, myself. Okay. Now I asked him, what did he say to you guys to let you, you know, you know, come here? Or did he convince you? He said, no, you guys decided one day that you want to make the move. Can we talk about the moment before the decision or what really triggered your decision to come down here to Ghana and uh, to start a new life, basically? Um, for me, life in the UK, it was getting on top of us. Um, I don't know how much you know about the UK, but the cost of living crisis is on at the moment. And that was really getting to us. I think there's a lot of pressure, you know, being a 22 year old in the UK to make it, be having this amount of money, um, a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time. And it's all in a place where it's so hard to do, a place where you're not even seen as equals. So watching my dad, the progress of where he had started and where he is now, um, that was a huge driving factor, but we just had conversations after conversations, watching YouTube videos after YouTube videos, you know, um, the possibilities in Ghana, how much could be done. And one day we just decided we're doing this. Mm -hmm. I think it was in November 2022, we said we're doing this yeah. and we're going to make sure we do it. And now here we are, May 2023. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's surreal, yeah. but... Yeah. Time, getting ready to go. So, yeah, this time, it's so about eight o'clock, we're gonna be in Ghana. We're gonna be enjoying them vibes. Tomorrow we're gonna be enjoying the sunshine. Yeah, man. Okay. I think that was something I was going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to do that, to be honest. Yeah, I know. Um. Hi, guys. Oh, my gosh. Where do I start? This move that you guys are making, it's massive. It's big. It's bold. It's brave. It's just amazing that you've decided to take this leap in such a young age with so much confidence and it's just it's out of this world i love you cuz i love you so much oh my gosh i love you and the kids i just want the best for you lot all through k i built a bond with you like you're you're my cousin you know what i'm saying like we're we're, we're family that's for sure and i just know you lot will look after each other I love you guys. Mm -hmm. Was it was it easy trying to make the step though? Because it's I can't imagine you you leaving the West, right? Now we from Ghana often look at the West and UK TV, the land of you know okay, you know what I'm saying. Okay, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and me hearing you say you have to, you know, what was some of the battling you had to you know deal with you know your, within your mind before? I think from my perspective. I'd always, I pretty much made my mind up that at some point in my life, I'm going to be moving back to Africa. The only thing that I wasn't sure of was the route that I was going to take, how it was going to materialise. Because ever since I've been about 13, 14 years old, I'd always been saying to my mum, you know, Wait, why can't we go and live there? Why can't we, you know, do things in Nigeria? And my mum kind of, you know, having worked so hard to come to England, she wasn't so um, excited about the idea of us just, you know, packing up and going away. So I kind of knew that I had to think of my own way to get, to get there. Um, so meeting Jada, that, w that really was special because I didn't have to convince her of anything. We were on the same page, you know, it was yeah. so soon after we started speaking that we kind of, you know, came to um, an agreement that, yeah, this is actually b what we both want and it's something that we'd be both be happy to do. So um, I think it's just been in us. Like you said, um, like we say, you get the call 
and the call just gets louder and louder and louder as time goes on. So you can't ignore it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And by the time it reached November last year, it was so loud that, you know, you can barely go to sleep without knowing that you're making moves to get there. So, um, yeah. Before you met her, now how did you guys meet? <laughs> <laughs> go on, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, so it's actually a very interesting story. So, um, so me and Jade, we actually met online, to be honest. Really? With you. Yeah, we did, yeah, we did, we did. Online dating. Online dating, so. That, that, Tinder that, to be exact. Tinder to be exact, yeah. Wow. If you guys yeah. want to promote us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's crazy because, you know, there's a lot of opinions about that and how things can go on there. But like I said, when things are meant to happen, they happen, you know. Um, the most high, he makes things happen in any way, any way, you know. Um, it's really a blessing. I'm, I'm happy seeing you and your, your, your children. You had uh, two, is it one or two? Two. two. So before I met Kay, I had one. Mm -hmm. And then we had another together. Yeah. Beautiful, girl. beautiful. And yeah. seeing you guys, I was there at the airport. I almost, you know, teared up because Daniel have been talking about seeing, you know, his children coming to the continent. You know, him building what he's building in the, in the you know, forest there you know, trying to set up a home for his family, basically. And seeing him just hug you guys, I'm like, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. Now, let's talk about, you've been on the site, you, you went to the land to, yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about it? Now you've seen it in physical, right? Well, at first it was the drone footages and whatever, but now you've seen it in physical, what do you think of it? It's unbelievable. unbelievable it's yeah. unbelievable, like, videos and pictures can't do it justice. At you all. actually have to be there, you have to stand on the ground to really value what you're, what you're seeing. Um, it's unreal, you know, just to know that he's come from a position in the UK, you know, just the same as anybody else and he's been able to create that, it's, I can't even describe it, I can't. As a man personally as well, um, seeing what he's been able to build with the work of his own hands um, and provide for his family is so inspirational, so inspirational. Yeah. And to see like fruit everywhere yeah. you know in the uk that's something we spoke about all the time there's you'll see trees but it's like they purposely plant trees that don't have fruit yeah. you know here you won't go hungry there's mm. planting there's cassava yeah. there's pineapples there's everything in abundance yeah. and all of that is just it's everything we always wanted yeah you know now i, I want to you know kind of you you he told me you also had a land yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you guys have bought the land and yeah. he promised me now, when you guys touch down, he's bringing you straight to the village and yeah. <laughs> you'll be sleeping in a tent right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. when, when are you guys, when are we going to see you sleep, sleep in a tent? Oh, it's not happening. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure he's a, he said that he's vowed that he's going to make us do it. So I have faith that, um, yeah, he, we're definitely going to do it. He vowed that he was going to come to Ghana and look at where we are. So yeah. um, I, I believe him when he says that. Let's, let's go back again to the UK, you know, work related. What were you guys doing? Um, prior to you guys moving back i'll start with you first so i did a bit of photography and videography in my spare time a bit of content creation mm -hmm. um but other than that i was a full-time home educator mm -hmm. to my two children and you know that was literally my life um but i never felt like i could fully fulfill what i wanted to do even being a mum, i couldn't be the best version of myself because there's always something in the uk it's always bills council tax mm -hmm. this that and you know being here i can fully be in those roles mm -hmm. happily, you know. Yeah. Um, I could be the best mother to my children, they, and my children, they have the freedom to run around, you know. Yeah. In the UK, our house was so small, so playing football in the house and all those things, it, you can imagine how that goes. <laughs> but here, they just have all the space to mm -hmm. run around and be free, and yeah. Um, and you know, videography and photography is something I want to carry on now that I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, but the opportunity is greater. I can do so much more, you know. Um, and you would know because, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And are uh, you? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, w I was just doing whatever I had to do to make things work, to be honest. Um, I had a few different jobs. Um, I, did, I started a landscaping company. Um, I, I st also did some social work as well. So I was working as a um, support worker. So I was working with young people that were a bit vulnerable um, and that needed care, that were in the care of the state. So, um, yeah, I, I literally, I juggled. I juggled so many things because I didn't necessarily have a specialised um, job or anything that I trained for. I, mean, I went to university twice and I dropped out twice, to be honest with you. Yeah, literally twice. Because I believed that I wasn't going for myself. I was going to have the space to figure myself out. Um, I felt like I needed to come out of like, my home space to understand who I am. Um, 
and I, I don't regret any of it. If I could go back in time, I would go back to you uni twice again. and drop out twice <laughs> again because it landed me exactly where I'm supposed to be. Do you know what I mean? If I didn't go the second time, then I wouldn't have met Jada. So, oh, you know, yeah. that's, why I, that's why I say God is great, man. Good story. That's a beautiful story. Now, you know, I know for a fact, I've interviewed a lot of diasporans and they said, listen, when I decided to embark on a journey to move to Africa, my friends, I was so surprised what they said to me. Are you crazy? Why are you going to Africa? You are in the UK. You, there's jobs here. It's a land of opportunity, milk and honey. What are you going to do in Africa? Tell me some of the you know things your friends and other family members, the ignorant ones, told you uh, before you know you decided to come to the continent. Oh boy. So um, I think for me, it was more of just the safety concerns. Um, I think my family, you know, mum, aunties, uncles. Um, they're concerned about the safety aspect. They come from a different time, to be honest. Um, the Africa that they knew when they left is different to what it is now. There were so much more things up in the air. We were still kind of trying to find ourselves. Um, but this day and age has changed. Um, so really, truly, it's just about having the strength of mind and the belief, the faith in the Most High, really, to know that what I'm being called to do is something that I'm going to put my mind to and go for it, despite all of the doubts, because sometimes when it's your elders that are throwing, putting doubts in your mind, it can um, be very powerful in changing what you're going to do. So, um, yeah, that was the main thing. But other than that, to be honest, um, the younger people in my life, I believe that my people have always had faith in me as an individual. Even when I failed, they know that I have, you know, what it takes to do what I want to do. So I always felt really supported by them. But it was just, you know, my elders that, you know, view me um, in a different way. They feel like they have to take care of me. Their concerns were more about my safety, the safety of my elders. Let's just put names to it. Was it your mom? Was it your dad? Like, <laughs> so you know, I, I spoke to my mom. I spoke to um, a couple of my aunties about it as well. Um, I spoke to my dad too. Um, to be fair, my dad, you know, be, being a guy, I think um, he was a bit more. He he took it a bit easier. Um, he kind of knew that I made my mind up, so there's not much convincing that could be done anyway. So his route was to just kind of advise me and give me a bit of guidance to make sure that. If I am going to do this, then I do it the right way and I do it in a way that keeps my family safe and secure. Um, but my mum, um, bless her, she, does, she loves me so much that um, I think the idea of me being in a place where she's not familiar with, uh, really that, that was kind of you know, playing on her mind a bit. So that was the main, that was the main thing. But other than that... Now you've been a Nigerian and then you... Um, why didn't you decide to say, listen, I want to move to the continent, but let's go to Nigeria? <laughs> yeah. You know what? We actually went yeah. through a phase where we was, we was talking about going to Nigeria yeah. because um, obviously I have family there, loads and loads of family infrastructure, like um, access to things like the land and all of that. But I think in me, I just felt like Ghana was the better place to come. Um, in Nigeria, it's a bit of a different situation at the moment. I know that in the future we're going to have the same kind of peace and tranquility that, as, that there is in Ghana. But as, as of right now, I didn't think it was the best place for me to bring young kids, you know, and uh, my partner who's going to be just getting introduced to Africa. So, um, yeah, we decided that Ghana is the place. And the way that I view things, I'm, I'm very Pan-African in my, in my views. So um, I view Ghana as my home just as much as Nigeria. I like that. And, uh, and I view Ghanaians as my brothers just as much and, and sisters just as much as Nigerians as well. So it was a no brainer for me. Yeah. Why are you in uh, Nigerian? And even finding him on Tinder, <laughs> after watching a, a video like, you know, the conspiracy about Tinder, Tinder student like all those things, you know, just to crack the joke. Why did you, you know, oversee, overlook the, you know, Nigerians are not, you know, what I'm saying like the stereotype basically, mm -hmm. and still went ahead and found your beautiful husband. You know, tell me about it. I want to see your perspective. Honestly, it, it was him. Yeah. Before he was Nigerian, he was K, you know? <laughs> and everything about him was just, I don't even know how to explain it. He just made me feel at peace. Um, I just saw, I saw who he is at heart, you know, before, um, before anything. And through our conversations, our, like our goals, what we wanted to do in life was aligned from the start, you know? Um, and from my previous relationship, it wasn't a good one. So I knew exactly what I wanted when I was, you know, dating again, searching again. And when I met Kay, I just, I just knew um, that he was the one for me. And on top of that, when it came to our move to Ghana, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without him right yeah. now, put it that yeah. way. As much as my dad came and he... Why? Let, let's talk about it. Why? Why? Let... Those jobs that he was juggling, that's what got us here first and oh. foremost, you know. <laughs> you know, he put hours upon hours upon hours wow. into getting us here and he didn't stop. He just didn't stop. He wouldn't stop until he knew that we would get here um, safely. Uh, just even the days where you sometimes don't believe, like, I'll be going. It's him that will beat Jada. It's okay, we're going, believe me, you know? And I believe what comes out of his mouth because look at us, we're here now, you know? So I have a him to thank for, for a lot, you know? For Union, I love it. What are some of the inconveniences and frustrations in the UK that really just kicked you? Like, may you be like, nah, I'm not, I, I'm not supposed to be here. I need to leave. Let's just dive into it, really into it. You know, the real story. So, um, so for me, growing up in the UK, the start of my life was spent in London, so zero to about 11. Mm. Um, I lived in London, so there, lot, there was a lot of people that looked like me. I wasn't even really too conscious of the fact that I'm an African, that I'm, well, sorry, not that I'm an African, that I'm black. Mm -hmm. You know, I always knew that I was an African, that I'm a Yoruba, but the fact that I'm black, it never played a role in my, in my mind too much. Um, and then my family, we moved to Clacton-on-Sea, which is like in Essex, and there's not a lot of diversity there at all. There, there was no other black people in my school. I think there was like one other mixed race child um, until my little brother came into the school, and then there was two of us. Um, and just being there, it made me aware that, okay, the UK isn't my home because I went through so much there. Um, things like being 12 years old, walking down the street with my little brother, and having men 18, 19, 20 years old shouting racial abuse at us in the street um, and feeling powerless because obviously you're just a child and there's a group of five or six men. Um, and then even other things in school, you know, I remember one, one occasion I was playing a school football match and um, once again, I'm the, only, I'm the only black person on the pitch. And, you know, I'm, there's a whole group of crowd of people on the, on the sideline telling me to get out of here, to go back to go back to where I come from, go back to Africa, telling me that I'm dirty. Um, wow. Yeah, really? all, yeah, all of these things. And I think one of the worst things about it was that, that I was on a I was on a pitch with people that I viewed as my friends, mm -hmm. and there was only one person that spoke up to even try and defend me. I was speaking up for myself, but there was only one other person that decided to speak up, you know, in support of me. That was one of my friends, his name Glenn Pym. I'll, I'll give him a shout out because I'll never forget him. Wow. No matter what anybody might say about this guy, when, when it was time for someone to speak up and say something, he's the one that stood up and said something. Mm. So um, I'm always gonna have respect for him for the rest of my life for that because I, I understand from the other side of the shoe, being in that space, okay. you know, when um, your counterparts mm -hmm. all have a certain mindset, to be the one to step out of that, do you know what I mean? And speak up for what's right, it can be difficult. So I have a lot of respect for him. But that was, that was I think that's one of the biggest things that really made me aware of the fact that I'm not in my home and I'm not where I'm supposed to be because when you're at home, you feel accepted, you know? Um, whether you've done good or bad, you know that, okay, like this is my home. And that made it clear to me that, you know, there was more for me in my life. and. Like I said, I've been telling my mom since I was about 14, 15, that I wanna, I wanna go back to Africa. And I believe that this is one of the seeds that was planted in my life um, to encourage me to feel that way. So looking back, I don't even regret it, but you know, I definitely remember it and it definitely played its role in me becoming who I am as well. Now, let, you said a little about you know, you being black and you don't know when that you are Yoruba. Yeah. Let's talk about your upbringing. Um, your, your mom, your parents, both of your parents are Nigerian? Yeah, both of my parents are Nigerian Yoruba. Okay, so my so dad's an Egba man, my mom's an Ijebu woman. Yeah. In like being, growing up from like a Nigerian home, really? So um, it was traditional. I've always had a traditional Yoruba upbringing, you know, every aspect of it, you know, how you greet your elders, how you, right. yeah, how you greet your elders, how you kind of interact with the family. It was very rooted in the Yoruba tradition and I always felt happy about that, I always loved it. Um, and it's only kind of until I moved out of Dagenham, um, which is a space that's very multicultural, to a space where I didn't see my culture represented at all, that um, I kind of took even more interest in my, in my culture and who I am as a Yoruba. And I did my research, you know, I read, 
I, I watched videos. I, was just, I had this intense hunger to find out who I am and why I am the way that I am. And um, yeah. Now, you know, being a Nigerian, like, you know, your journey, like, you know, moving, moving is not really easy. I, 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 you would agree with me. Yeah, yeah. You would agree with me. Being, having to, you know, escape the mindset of you escaped Africa yeah. for greener pastures and you having to rearrange that thoughts and be like, oh, Africa is it's not a place you have to be saved from, but really is the paradise, right? It's, it's not easy. Let's just say as, as it is. Your friends, you mean, let's talk about it. How were you able to overcome that? Um, literally, I, what, the first thing I've got to say really is that the most high really, I believe that I was born um, to do what I'm doing now. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly now. When I think about my whole life, even before I moved to Clacton and everything, the signs were always there for me to be what I am now, you know. Um, I was always curious, I always wanted to know. That was something that was so key for me. And um, I think my culture was a path for me to understand who I am, aside from my culture, if that makes sense. You know, at the end of the day, we're all children of the Most High, you know. You, you come here, you come into this world and you're given a culture, you're given an ethnicity, and that's your route to discover who you are. It's your route to discover your way back, you know what I mean, to the source, to the Most High. And I just believe that I was blessed with a great path, to be honest. It was always clear to me that, um, that there's a higher power in my life. I never, ever doubted that for a second. And I always knew that if I set, set my mind to something, it would come to fruition, you know? Um, and that's also down to my culture as well. You know, day one in life, my parents always told me, you'll always be the head, you'll never be the tail. These are the kind of affirmations that they, you know, put into me as a child. And so for me now, growing into a man, I can't imagine myself failing, I, I just cannot. So, you know, that paired with me and my desire to come back here is a recipe for success, you know? I like that. Yeah. yeah. This is a beautiful story. Thank you. Beautiful story. Now, on the other hand, you were into um, a little bit of um, video production, creating of content. What in your little bubble almost triggered for you? I know you're union now, so it would be almost similar. But what in your little own way triggered that for you? Um, triggered the move? Yeah. So, a lot of things, I think similar to his experience, I, uh, I started off in Labrick Grove, which is um, quite a diverse area. You'll see a lot of black people. I moved to Enfield, which again was the same. Um, and that was when I was in year six. But year six is when we made the move to Hillingdon, um, which is, at the time, was very white. A lot of white people there. Um, and I also experienced racism. I remember, you know, being called the N-word, walking across the road and not really understanding why. Um, but the real trigger for me, I can remember quite clearly. Um, my son, he went to school for reception for about a term. And I knew it was something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to send him to public school. Um, but I sent him and he came home and we, we have conversations, you know, how was your day at school? And at five years old, he came back and he told me, um, I don't play with anyone, mummy, I don't have friends. And I said, oh, why, what, what happened, Keziah? And he said, the little boys at school said they don't want to be my friend because I'm not white. Really? And I just could not believe it. it you can imagine as a mum, it just broke my heart. And that day he never went back to school. I took him out and he never ever went back to that school. And for me, that's when I knew this isn't the place for him. You know, um, it's one thing being a black woman in the UK, but a, a black man, a young black boy, scary sometimes yeah. you know um and i just knew it was something i had to do if not for me for my children and that was the biggest trigger and ugh, i'm so glad i did it yeah. i'm so glad i did it because like it. that's not an experience that i believe five-year-olds should have to go through you know some people think that these are the experiences we have to go through to toughen up you know but it's not it's not the life of five-year-olds we should be free you know we shouldn't even know racism exists mm -hmm. but it's the sad reality of a lot of young children in the UK yeah. and not a lot gets done about it. The policies in schools say, you know, if you're bullied, you come to school and we'll deal with it, but they don't deal with anything. And for me as a mum, there's only one way to deal with that. I'm either going to fight or I'm going to, you know, yeah. um, do something else. And that was take my child away from that situation. And that was really the trigger for me. I, remember I interviewed Daniel just last week, I think, and he said he can send a curl 
to buy water in just the nearby um, town and he'll feel at peace knowing he's safe. But he can't do the same in the UK because he might be stabbed or killed. How was safety like? You having to have children and you know having to nurture them in the environment like the UK with a crime rate over the roof. Let's talk about it. At their age that they are now, they're quite young, so the fear of safety wasn't huge. But um, uh, like I said, young black boys, there's there's a lot of uh, stabbing, knife crime, all of that stuff going on in the UK right now, and. There's nothing being done about it. There's not a lot of things in place, you know. Um, here, there's so much for young people to do. Since we've come here, the kids have been able to go to gaming centre, play zones, this and that, and you can just feel... <sighs> but in the UK, you can't even send your child to school without the worry of, are they going to come back home, mm. you know? And for that, school's meant to be somewhere children can go and be free, mm. go and be happy, learn. A lot of children ain't learning in school anymore. No. You know, they're fighting, they're getting up to no good. They're learning stuff that is not in line with the most high. It doesn't serve them at all. It doesn't serve yeah. them at all. And like the fear for their safety will only continue to grow the older they get, you know. You know, I, I know you guys have a message for people who look like you and I, and even Nigerians. And, and, and what well, if you do have that message for, you know, your people and because let's talk about the system first. The system that we have in the UK is just conveniences. Oh, you can get this fast, you can get this fast, and we feel like we are free, but really we are just slaves to the system. Yeah. Now, you guys just left that, and then you've been able to move here where you have your land, and there's so much future ahead of you guys building and owning things, you know. Daniel always says that he never owns a land, he's stealing it. But, you know, being able to even have your own land, in the UK you can't have that, right? So you making this move, I know you do have a message for people who look like just you and I. If you do have that message, what would, what would that message be? To anybody that's watching, that looks like us, that even relates to us, just come home. That's my message. Come to a place where you're going to be seen for who you are. If you're a good man, people will see you for the good man that you are. If you're a bad man, people will see you for the bad man that you are. Rather than being in a space where no matter how good your heart is, people are going to prejudge you based on things that they've been told by people that don't care about you. You know, um, if, you're, if you're like me and you've been walking down the street or you've seen an old lady with bags and you've wanted to approach and help, but when you get close enough, she's crossed the road in fear of you. If you understand that feeling, come to a place where you can actually serve your people in peace, you know, and, and actually have the, not even for the thanks, but just for the fulfillment in your soul of actually being able to serve others come to a place where it's actually wanted, you know, and accepted and appreciated. That's my message. My message would be for the young people, I would say, just come because there's so many opportunities. And for some reason, I speak to a lot of young people, they believe that all the opportunities are in the UK, in the West, but I can't even explain how many opportunities there are here. If you have a business idea, it will thrive here. Anything you do will thrive here, um, but you have to make that step to know you know you'll be seen as an equal here you'll be seen for the value that you hold but the first step is making that move so come now we have daniel here daniel hello again seeing your your welcome on the show seeing your daughter sitting next to you yeah. in accra ghana africa tell me about what does that mean to you uh bro it's it's history it's it's history as well as very emotional I'm over here listening to them and it's very emotional for me, I ain't gonna lie. It's, it's something that, you know, as a father, first of all, most having a daughter, this is my firstborn daughter. Having a daughter, I think one of the biggest worries for fathers is who their partner's gonna be. And you know, for her to have found Kay, for me, that's the first step. Do you know what I mean? Like, I have so much respect for Kay um, because he's shown the qualities of a man. He's shown the qualities of, you know, first of all, uh, going against the grain of what the, of the UK, you know, of how they try to paint the, the structure. He understands the structure, most high, man, woman, child. He understands that structure and, you know, bringing back the organic family. And then having them here now, it's like, it's surreal. But this is just the first step. 
you know, this is just a, for me personally, I know that, you know, we're trying to build an empire and having K, because, you know, this is my firstborn daughter, but she's my daughter. But having K here as a man, I mean, just yesterday, just yesterday, me and him were on the land in Yehuda village, the 50 acre village that we're creating. And that was a rites of passage, right? Yes. Yeah, we were going through some serious bush. It was like nine of us and we all forgot cutlasses. Yeah. We forgot the cutlasses. So we had to go through thick bush, just, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a Sophie. Mm, really? Yeah. Like literally. So he was thrown in at the deep end yeah. and seeing how he handled that. He said to me at the end, it's like, uh, it's like, I think I've deserved your daughter's like hand in marriage now. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? I was like, you passed the test. Do you know what I mean? So just knowing that there's, you know, somebody who is also willing to be in service. He's not come here with an ego. He's not come here with that Western mentality. Like he was shoveling cement and, and you know, mortar with the workers the other day. Level. Not thinking he's better than anybody. For me, that shows a lot. Do you know what I mean? So, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning, Avery. You, you, you are here. Here. You are here, and and he's sitting next to you. You've been to the land. Tell me how you feel. I just feel. I feel happy over everything to see my dad again. It's been a long time, and me and my dad are like this. Um, as you can see, we look like clothes. <laughs> um, but honestly, just sitting next to him again and after everything, after watching him from where he started, I just, it's emotional as well for me to just be here next to him and being able to just watch him grow as well. As much as I've been watching us grow and our family, I'm so proud of my dad. I'm so proud of him and how far he's come and what he's shown me, you know. Um, and he always said he was gonna he was gonna send for us and he, he kept his promise. So I I have no other words than just I'm happy and I'm blissed. This is just half the pack. This is this is, there's many more. Mm -hmm. I have my son, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. He's to come. I have another 12 year old. How old is my new ten? Yeah. Eleven. Ah, uh, the one. Yeah. This is this is. Janae over here. Janae, right? Yeah. You should come on camera. Janae, come along. <laughs> Let's have it. It's, it's too can tiny. Squeeze. Oh, she can squeeze it. Yeah, she yeah. can squeeze it. We're all small. We're all small. So, yeah, like, like I said, Janae, and then, you know, we have two more daughters in the UK and a son. Um, and my son is, you know, doing very well, doing his six, uh, sixth form exams. And, you know, he's coming when he's finished th that. So, this is just the beginning. Like, I have three generations here. Me, one, two, and then their children, my grandchildren. I'm a granddad. Bro, bro, I'm a granddad. <laughs> <laughs> Me just thinking about it, it's just... It's, just, it's, wow. it's surreal, yes. bro. And they're it's all surreal. coming to the continent. Yeah. And you yeah. told me your vision is to see all your family on that land. And yeah. yeah. Even my mother. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Jada Lee's Nanan, Daniel's mom. And this is my message to Daniel, not Daniel, sorry, to Kay and Jada and their little family who is um, transitioning to Africa. I am so proud of them. Um, I'm going to miss them so much because um, they're at my house every Sunday. Without fail, this is um Yamika, who Yamika, is um, Jada's um, little one, my great granddaughter, which I'm all proud of, and <laughs> and my great grandson, Kazaya. Oh, I'm going to miss dearly. So, hey guys, this is the end of the road for us. But we'll hopefully, we'll I will soon. be joining them soon, very, very soon. So, my best wishes to them. I wish them all the best for the future. And, um, yes, guys, well done to you. I want to see her here. Wow. Do you know what I mean? That'll be four generations. 
Like, that's breaking generational curses. Beautiful. Let's speak with Janae. What's your name? Introduce yourself to the people watching you. Um, hi, I'm Janae. I'm 13 years old. 13 years old. Now, you, you came with, I was at the airport. I saw you there hugging your dad and just, you know, all emotions. What, what made you want to come to Ghana? Um, well, Ghana's different to the UK and it's much better. Um, from the UK, um, I feel like I'm equal here more than I am in the UK. Really? Yeah. What makes you say that? Because, like, racism and stuff, I've seen it, I've experienced it, and... Even at 13 years old? Years old. Wow, what are some of the racism you experienced at that age? Um, like, I've been called the M-word before, um... I've been called a monkey. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this deep, guys. It's, imagine, like, my daughter was actually struggling in school. Mm -hmm. So she was struggling and, you know, the teachers were involved and she was, she was chewing, to, chewing if, if we, uh, you know, she wasn't turning up at school. But I know that feeling. I know that feeling of not being accepted in school, of not, and just not wanting to go. Because I know, I know my bloodline, and my bloodline needs stimul stimulating. We're creative people. My daughter's a creative, you know, a content creator. So I know what she needs. So I said to her mum, send her to me. Send her to me. I mean, it's not a definite that she's going to stay yet. I don't know if she wants to, but it's not a definite. But if she wants to, there's space for her here. Because I know what this continent's going to give her as a young woman is far more than the UK can give her. She's gonna learn life skills here. She's gonna see. She's gonna. She's gonna see her peers that look like her. That's gonna give her confidence. Like you know what Tian had. Yeah, yeah. Tian had that. Yeah. She had that. Do you know what I mean? She still got it. Yeah. And she's gone back to the UK with full confidence. Mm -hmm. And 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 this is what. You see the nervousness you see in her. <laughs> give her three months. <laughs> three months. Yeah, I like that, guys. Seeing you here. Because I've interviewed him, I think almost I checked the date. It was not eight months. No. It's it's almost a year ago. A year, yeah. 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 And then he was telling me how, you know, you guys would be coming. He wants. He sees that vision, and then me seeing you here with your wife and, and children, his grandkids and his children, daughters. It's just beautiful. Me looking from the outside, mm. you know. And I know you guys do have a message. Mm. Really, you do have a message for people who look like mm. just us. Now, they give their message. I know you do have a message. Mm. What, what would that message be? I think my message today would be to the families. To the families. There's a lot of... I mean, when I was coming, I was looking for families that have moved to Ghana, and there was hardly none at that time. So people coming with young children, well, look, we're all here. We're not suffering. We're not suffering. We came, we paved the way, and now they're here. They can be here comfortably. Not, not like it's going to be easy, but make the move. I'd rather suffer here than in the UK. I mean, it's cold. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's suffer in the heat. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, wait, it's wait, simple. Wait, sunny days. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Now, he, he was very candid, right? With, together with Jero, and he, they said to me one point in their life, they, they had to go through some difficult times being... A homeless. I like saying that because listen, I know people are watching us and they are there right now. You know, some people are watching and they are there and um, they just don't believe that with that step, the, the fate step, things can turn around. Mm. So me saying that is just to always remind the people that listen, it doesn't matter what where you are. If you see it, the vision and you just make you know the bold step, your dreams might come to pass. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So he said that, and then I'm like, wow. And then going to the land just last two weeks, mm. and there's three buildings. Yeah. Mind you, eight months, just nine months ago, it was just one, yeah. right? And now it's three. I'm like, over a period of a year, mm. I'm like, wow. In two years, it's fully completed. You know, it's furnished, it's, it's in suit. There's trees, uh, fruits on the compound. All these things were, was hitting his head when I was interviewed. Now it's almost a, a reality. You know what I'm saying? So me seeing you guys even here, it's just, 
it's a sign that listen everything is, is, is you know coming to pass now if you guys do have a message like a really strong message standing out to anybody um, in the West diaspora anywhere what would that message be I'll start from you okay so I think um, my message first and foremost I want to send a message to my fellow Nigerians my fellow Yorubas um, don't think that just because you know you're Nigerian that you're restricted to moving back to Nigeria. Like I said, I'm, a, I'm very Pan-African in my mindset and before these borders were created by Europeans, we used to move freely, you know, and that's the reality that I subscribe to. I don't subscribe to the reality that, oh, because, you know, my passport is green and it says Nigeria on it, I'm not welcome in Ghana or I'm not brothers with a Ghanaian or sisters with a, um, brothers, a brother to Ghanaian people get rid of that out of your mind because that's the thing holding us back as a collective. The minute that we destroy these borders, the mental borders as well as the physical borders, that's when we're all gonna thrive as a people. So my message is to program your own mind. Get rid of the programming that they try to force feed you with as a child, as a, as a young person, and take, take in positive, you know, positive programming. Because um, at the end of the day, we're all under some form of program make sure that the one that you're under is serving you and serving your family um, and come home, yeah. I like that. My message, is, my message would be to the mums, the young mums, the single mums, mums of any kind, take your children to freedom. Um, in the UK they disguise a lot of things with, oh it's benefits, you know, like benefits or you get this or you get this single person's discount. That stuff isn't for us. You know, um, and it's not benefits. It's just stuff to keep us comfortable in their system. Mm. Take your children to freedom where they can be free and you can be free and you can do the things that you want to do. You can own land and you can have your children run free and, you know, watch them grow up in a place where they're equals. They have people, reflections around them. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, do you have a message? My message would be to young black kids. Um, ignore racist comments. Um, because you're beautiful the way you are and you should um, and yeah and be confident um, in your black skin and yeah I like your hair by the way you. <laughs> you do have a YouTube channel isn't it? Yeah. what is the name of the YouTube channel? Life, Life of Janae King Life of Janae King? Janae King Janae King, King. King. Yeah. wow I'm going to put it on the screen guys go check it out what would you be doing on that YouTube channel? Um, Vlogs, just showing you guys what I'm doing in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, vlogs. Guys, go and check it out. Um, Daniel. Yeah. If you do have a final message. My message for the granddads. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? My message is for firstly the people in Africa and also the diasporans. The time is now. The time is now to build up Africa. You see what's happening with the dollar? We don't need the West no more. We have the resources here. Many people have tried. Gaddafi, many people have tried. Uh, Mugabe, uh, many. Now it's time, like the time is now to unite. Let's, let's forget the borders. Let's forget, oh, you're Nigerian, you're Ghanaian, you're from Zimbabwe. Let's forget that. Let's unite as Africa, one continent because when we stand together we are the superpower we are the superpower and if with the help of our brothers and sisters from the diaspora we're gone clear nothing can stop that nothing at all and then here's our grandchildren and children coming up in that energy well what can stop that i mean maybe we're too old to make the change but these are the revolutionaries these are the ones that are gonna stand up and be like they're coming with something from the West. So we're learning. We take something from Africa and we bring something to Africa. So we can learn from each other and together we can be strong. Um, so at night time I was in my room, I was chilling on my phone and there was a gecko crawling on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran out my room and I knocked on their door. And I said, there's a gecko in my room. I started crying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why do you cry? It's, like, it's they're everywhere. 
they are called the landlords. <laughs> so they're just checking up on you to make sure you're, you're good, everything is okay. Making sure you're taking care of the place. <laughs> Why were you crying? Because um, this came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> In the UK, you're not used to that. No. Yeah? You don't see no uh, cockroaches, no gecko and anything. Just spiders. Spiders? Have you ever seen a snake up close before? A snake? Yeah. Here? No, I mean in the UK. Oh, no. But here you've seen it, yeah? You saw a snake? Yeah, a little baby one. Where? It was on my dad's land. Really? Black yeah. Mamba. Black Mamba. <laughs> really? That's, that's a very that's, good that's walk hunt. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, how, did you, how did you react to it? It was dead. Oh, it was dead. Mm. So, I wasn't scared of it. But life, would you have been able to kill it? No. no. You learn. <laughs> I think sooner or later she'll begin to kill snakes. Yeah. <laughs> you watch her. You watch her in a few months. Yeah. We are at the end of the conversation and uh, seeing this family here is just beautiful. And uh, they do have a final message. Daniel do have a final message. So. I do know I have a prediction. Prediction? I'm, yeah. Okay. So you see how many is here now. Yes. I told you there's more to come. Yes. So hopefully eight months a year, mm -hmm. we're going to double up. We're going to look like the Simpsons on the couch. We're going to double up. We're going to have many more here. Hopefully, these guys will be set up with their house on their land. Business will be thriving. And, you know, yeah, just more of us here. This is beautiful. Guys, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, guys, I'm going to leave all their names on the screen and also their YouTube channel and where you can find them. Go check them out, reach out to them. If you do have questions, please reach out to them and uh, they might be of help to you. Daniel, reach out to Daniel, reach out to Kay. And uh, yeah, as I already say, if it's your first time here, please don't forget to like the video, share to friends and family and subscribe. And uh, guys, let's say bye-bye to them. All right? Bye. 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 <laughs> Right, now here it is, TJ Coast, yeah. Yeah. Talk about K, extending the network, Kemp Coast going global, mm -hmm. we're going to have the Ghana network, studios opening, mm -hmm. we've got some property shouts, yeah, we got you, yeah. you know, obviously mine's going to be far away but it's close at heart, yeah, you know what I mean, the brother's always family and uh, we're going to miss you though. For real man, for real man, oh. love my bro, love, 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 love. Mikey, you yeah. yeah, K Coast. Mate, good luck in Ghana. Thank you. I know you're going to kill it because out of any, anyone, you, you d you're definitely the guy that can make it work. So, yeah, mate, all the best of luck here. Come on, love my bro. KD Coast. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've messed that one up. Didn't That's it, staying really, in. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, best of luck. To you and Jada, I know you've been working on this for years mm -hmm. and years. So um, follow your mind, follow the vision. Mm -hmm. Years we've been in this together. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna miss you, my bro. Come on. Wish you all the best and lots of love, man. Always there for you, bro. Are we? Yeah. We We're are. all saying goodbye yeah. to to this little man here and this young lady here. She's only going for a while, but she'll, but she'll be gone. We're still saying bye for now. So here we are, this is um, Carol's family, who I'm proud to be a part of now. And they're going off to Africa, some of them. Going off to Ghana forever, which is quite sad really, but that's reality. Well, here we are in the final celebration. Celebration, uh, we call them bubblations. We call them uh, hanging, you know, and it's the best thing is uh, just getting to hang out, spend time with each other. So this is a goodbye for for a temporary time to k coast the one and only legend all right and uh gonna be coming out to ghana soon gonna be uh making music soon yeah, we're all just gonna be on top of the world Brilliant. and one love yeah, there you go. Go. yo jada's little cousin i can't believe you lot are going to ghana man it didn't feel real until now no more sunday dinners with jada and the family it's gonna feel different but Hope you'll enjoy it and I'll see you out there at some point.